Oh, the popular Mike Chirico, NBC uh, Football Night in America and Sirius XM Masters play-by-play joining us on the program. Mike, good morning. How are you? DP, how are you? I'm good. The uh, biggest... Is that, uh, is that your Masters green sweatshirt hoodie that you're wearing today? It's, uh, no. I, no. I, I was trying to go with a little Masters green, but it's a different shade. Do you remember back at the mothership when Boomer would do baseball tonight on the Sunday night of the Masters and wear his green jacket? Oh, my God. <laughs> and he spent a lot of money on that green jacket. He was – Chris, right? <laughs> Chris Berman was really proud of those jackets because he never wore a suit. He'd always right, have ever. a sport yeah. coat and, and he'd have his Dockers on, but always right. had his green jacket. I do remember <laughs> that. What you were. <laughs> the jacket. <laughs> um, uh, the difference in doing radio and TV at Augusta. Biggest difference is what? So I, I only did radio in 2019 before, and uh, they asked me to come back uh, for, for this year, and I got to work with Curtis Strange, which was fun. He's my old partner. Um, you know, it's so in town. Usually, golf, you're trying to stay quiet, people can watch what's happening. Uh, but you're trying to describe the holes. You're just describing what the players are wearing. You're trying to read the shot shape of the ball in the air, all that stuff. There's a great group, uh, Sirius XM. Uh, they do the PGA Tour radio almost every week. And most of those individuals were on the Masters coverage. And they do such a good job. So it was try not to screw it up and just try to spin it with other folks. But, uh, you know, somebody said to me, why are you going to do radio? Like, well, only two people get to call the Masters. Jim does, obviously, with CBS, Jim Nance. And if you get to do radio, why not? If you love golf and you love calling golf, be a part of history. You know from your times there. Uh, anytime you can be associated with the Masters, it's a, a great sense of pride. It's also a great experience in your career. So I was happy to do it. It was a blast. A great, great group of people to work with. And who decides where you go? I know in a TV broadcast, you know, they're going right. to say you're on this one in, you know, hey, we're going to then go to 14 after this. Uh, how do you kind of navigate? Good question. Same kind of deal. Uh, because there were announcers almost at every set of holes, like an announcer at Amen Corner, an announcer at 15, 16, it was bouncing around. So we would do 8, 9, 10, 14, and 18 with me and Curtis uh, in the main broadcast position and then went out to 18. And it was kind of fun because going out to 18, you're 25 yards away from the hole. So you are in full announce golf announcer whisper mode, which doesn't <laughs> happen much anymore because the, the towers as they're constructed are now covered with soundproofing and all that. But here it's open top and you're just covered by a little plexiglass. So you're in full. He has this now to win the Masters. Go, oh my God, look at me. I'm, I'm a meme of myself, an audio <laughs> meme of myself. But it was great and great to be there to see Scotty Scheffler finish that off. What a, what a really cool run he's had. And it's no fault of Scotty's, but it felt like there was a letdown of sorts because Tiger kind of had, he put down the breadcrumbs and we're like, oh man, this is awesome. Yeah, He's under par. He made the cut. Now he gets to the weekend. This is when Tiger, he's going to wear red on Sunday. He's going to be there. And then all of a sudden you realize that he became a mere mortal, like we probably uh, expected him to do after those first couple of rounds. At what point did you think what we saw is not what we're going to continue to see with Tiger? Yeah, later on on Friday afternoon, you know, uh, it was funny. We were talking about why does Tiger do this? Why is this impact? Well, it's hard to quantify. It's so many different reasons. But here we are on Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning. I'm on the Today Show. Noted Begay is on the Today Show. Scott Van Pelt's on Good Morning America. Uh, Dana Jacobson was there for CBS. It, it became larger than sports, which the Masters often is. It's the one golf event that jumps a little bit above the radar. But he's the one guy who takes it to another level. And you saw that. And we're on the air on Golf Central, on Golf Channel on Thursday, Tiger's Tiger's even par. Tiger's one under par. He's got a punt to tie for the lead on Thursday. And you're going, wow, this is crazy. Because it was, given where he was. And Dan, given that his camp was really shocked. If you would have asked on March 1st, do you think Tiger's going to play the Masters? Most around him would have said no. So this came on uh, pretty quickly for the people who were in the know there. Uh, but I think by Friday, he started to realize that he can't drive it where the other guys were. And you can see him laboring a little bit. And then Saturday, Sunday, I think the wear and tear of that 
plus not being in competition as much as he has been. Tiger was best at grinding out a par. He just couldn't do that on Saturday and Sunday. And he responded to, you know, the patrons rooting him on when he would have a bad hole. And and that helped him because he's so used to hearing the roars, he's done something well. And, you know, Tiger doesn't want to be embarrassed out there. Tiger's out there to win. And then it felt like you're on a ride that you don't want to be on, but you got to see it to the very end. And, you know, you kind of walk away and, you know, kind of take inventory. And now he's going to play, uh, you know, in the British Open at St. Andrews. So I thought yeah. the win was him getting there, Mike. I thought that that was that, the no victory. Doubt. Thousand percent, Dan. I, I'm I'm totally with you, and uh, you know we've sat in the chair working with analysts, and we'll often look at them and say, "What do you take away from that round?" Well, what I took away from Tiger's first round was that word of appreciation and gratitude. You heard that a lot this week, but as I said on the air, I've never seen Tiger shoot 71 and smile the way he was smiling when he came off the golf course on Thursday, which gave you a sense that only he knew what he did and how hard he had to work to get to Thursday. And same thing for Tiger to shoot the two highest scores he's ever shot at Augusta in a tournament, 78, 78 over the weekend and walk off that 18th green with that world famous, recognizable ear to ear, toothy smile that to tells you what it meant for him to get there, to play, to make the cut and to finish 72 holes. Tiger was never about that. And I think he allowed himself to take in more of the appreciation from the people around him than ever before. And if the mountain was as high as we believe when you're talking about potentially having your leg removed and amputated, 13 months later, you're playing on a tough, as you know, a tough golf course to walk and you do it for four days, then he should be really proud of what he did. We're talking to Mike Trico, who uh, is also the voice of Sunday Night Football and his wildest off-season that I can remember, Mike. Um, do you guys know what your opening night game is going to be, or do you do you have an idea of who you think it's going to be? Uh, an idea, but I certainly think we don't know. These things are so changeable, I, I, as as you know. You would hope and imagine that the champs are somewhere in there, that the Rams will do that, whether it's Thursday or Sunday in, in week one. That has become the tradition in the league, so you would hope that would happen. But uh, I think we're all anxiously, oh, certainly I'm anxiously looking forward to May to find out where we're going to be to start the season. And, you know, all the places will go. And I think, Dan, with so many good teams, this might be a really interesting year with flexing to games on the Sunday night schedule. But let, let me give you the AFC this way, right? A lot of people say, who's the best team in the AFC? So start going division by division. Who are the teams in the AFC that you think can't make the playoffs? And when you go through that list right now, here in April, three, maybe four, that tells you that the AFC is going to be wide open as the year goes on. Health, when you play people, how healthy you are when you play people, that's going to go a long way. I bet you there are going to be four or five teams right now who think they're going to make the playoffs. And then after the draft, of course you think you're going to make the playoffs. Who aren't going to in the AFC? And I think it's going to be a real fight for those spots this year. I really do. And I mentioned this a couple of times to my audience. You know, it wasn't that long ago when Russell Wilson was a Seahawk. Brady was retired. Aaron Rodgers' future up, uh, was in doubt. Carson Wentz a Colt. Devontae Adams a Packer. Calvin Ridley was still active. Khalil Mack was a Bear. Von Miller was a free agent. Mitchell Trubisky was in Buffalo. Troy Aikman and Joe Buck were with Fox. And Deshaun <laughs> Watson was preparing for a grand jury. And Bruce Arians uh, was still the head coach. That was March, Mike. I know, I know, right? And we're only at April 11th. And we've got the draft and some trades probably somewhere around there too. And all these teams with multiple picks. Some people deal in a pick to get to next year. People deal in picks to get to the value part of this draft, 30 to 50 or 60. And we're going to see good players come out of there. We always do. The NFL, you talk about how Tiger takes the spotlight and attention when he's in a golf tournament. When the NFL makes news, it just takes all the attention away from everything else. And, and it has become the biggest entertainment vehicle in America. It gathers people. It connects people. W walking around Augusta, just seeing people and saying, hi, do you think my Bills have a chance this year? <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you think we'll get a Sunday night home game this year? I mean, this is just random. And people talk about the Jaguars. Hey, do you like their free agent signings? Like, I, I think they can be pretty good. Everybody has... 
an unbelievable, bizarre nature of, I guess, overhyped hope with the free agency and draft moves. You think we're one or two teams, one or two moves away. And you know what, Dan? And you, you know it because it's a team close to your heart. Look at the Bengals this year. Were you thinking this time last year, not only would the Bengals be a Super Bowl team, but a team that you were, were really looking forward to watching the following year and for a few years to come? No. And that's why I think the NFL has this magnetism because everybody's a two chess move away from we can be really good situation. I love that about the league right now. And I don't know of another sport uh, where you have that hope, that optimism when you go to spring training or it, it's the NBA, you know, the Orlando magic fans don't go, this could be our year or, uh, you know, throw out even somebody like Pittsburgh pirates, you know, you might, might get be a playoff team, but the NFL allows you to actually dream. You know, there are certain fan, fan bases that probably go, let's be realistic here. We're lions fans or, you know, we're Jags fans, but everybody else you go, if the Bengals can do it, why can't we? And Jags and Lions fans are saying the same thing now, right? Okay, we've got Trevor Lawrence. We're, we've acquired a bunch of players, have some draft picks. Where are the Lions? Well, guess what? You go back and watch the last half dozen games, and Chris Collinsworth and I were talking about this a few weeks ago. Go back and watch the last four or five games. The Lions gave people a real headache. They played hard. and you know, The whole bite the kneecaps thing, et cetera, with Dan Campbell. They played hard. And I love the fact that they're on hard knocks because people are going to see what they're building and that may make it attractive to other. And all of a sudden you're a quarterback or you're a couple of skilled players, a game changer on defense away in a division that after Aaron Rodgers and the Packers, you can contend pretty quickly. So there is that hope. Whereas like you said, and I'll just stay with where I live with in Detroit with the Tigers reference um, for the last couple of years, the Detroit Tigers had no chance this year. The guys who they drafted number one, guys like uh, Spencer Torkelson and, and Riley Green, they're now coming up to the big club, although Green got hurt at the end of, uh, of spring training. But they went out and acquired Javi Baez. They acquired some veterans. And now the Tigers have a chance. They have a chance to be a playoff contending team. But it took three years to build that or four years. So you're right. The NFL, it happens like this. The other sports, it takes a while. And let's think about our society. People want instant. They want microwave, fast, quick. And that may be part of the subliminal appeal to the year-round run that the NFL always seems to get. NFL's undefeated, Mike. <laughs> That's exactly right. Undefeated. No matter how hard sometimes, yeah. no matter how hard sometimes it tries, it wins every game. You're but exactly I wonder, right. though, the sport, you know, it dwarfs everything. And now it's dwarfing, mm. you know, March Madness. You know, that was during March that you had all those stories. Right. That's what I wonder about with these other sports being collateral damage because the NFL is so big. I can turn on any show this yeah. morning and they're probably trying to find an NFL story to talk about instead of Frank Vogel getting fired or Scotty Scheffler winning the Masters. Right. Is Scotty Scheffler the next great golfer who's won four times in eight weeks? Um, look at our conversation right here, yeah. right? It, it's kind of, it, it, it reverts back because it always feels like there's something you're interested in hearing about. Even the NBA, I think the super teams and the movement in many regards has not allowed teams to build and get familiar with. And guys move around. And with the 82-game schedule, you lose that passion. Like I remember being so excited to see what are the playoff matchups? What's going to be the uh, late afternoon game on ABC on Saturday? How are the series going to match up? And, and I peaked just this morning. So, okay, well, Denver Golden State, that's a heck of a first-round Series. I'm looking forward to that. I want to see if Giannis and Milwaukee can. I want to see how real Phoenix was, what they learned from last year. But there's not that same feeling for 12 months. It's just now because we're getting to the runway where the NBA takes off. And a lot of us who weren't spending all the time on the 82 games dial in for six weeks. With the NFL, it's 12 months for 17 games, which mm -hmm. is pretty remarkable. Steve Kerr said, he was asked about how do you – maybe encourage teams to play their players, stars, more games. And he said, why don't we go to 72 games? Do you think that that would fly, that more players would play in more games because we're taking 10 regular season games off the schedule? No, I, I think we're trying to just get everybody to where they need, they're, they're needed the most, right? So 
maybe if you went to 60 games and it really became a challenge to make the playoffs. But as you know, there are so many reasons you can't do that. Live gate tickets, building availability, because so many of these teams have a piece, if not the entirety of ownership of their building, local and regional sports networks, uh, streaming, all of that stuff. How are you going to make all the streaming money and the regional sports networks uh, trying to earn their money back for their investment? So you need the content. But I think, look, why is the NFL so valuable? Because it's only 16 games. And in a month, you're through 25% of your season, where it's half that in the NBA, or a third of that, or less than that in the NBA and the NHL and Major League Baseball is much less than that, right? So what happens one night, two nights is not a big deal. You'd have to, I think, shrink the number even more than 72. And now you start messing with historical and all mm. that stuff. So um, it makes sense. It would be nice if it happens. But in reality, does that work on the financial side of the business? And let's forget that this is commerce. This is capitalism. This is business at the end of the day. Good to talk to you as always. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Same here, pal. Thank you, buddy. Anytime. Miss you. That's uh, Mike Tirico, Sunday Night Football, play-by-play, taken over for Al Michaels and uh, was on the call on Sirius XM at the Masters.